Okay, this is exciting. Dr. Gord Lovegrove leads research in both sustainable development and sustainable transport safety, which he says boils down to a basic idea. How do we sustain a desired quality of life, meet current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same? One area that shows great promise and has long interested Dr. Lovegrove is hydrail or hydrogen-powered railways. We have been researching hydrail and ways to convert our North American railway fleet from dirty, stinking, noisy diesel to clean, green, quiet hydrogen fuel cells for over 10 years. There are many advantages to hydrail, according to Dr. Hofrichter, a pioneer in the field. Railways have a significantly lower environmental footprint than transportation on the roads. Pairing that with hydrogen makes that an even stronger advantage as the energy that is actually being used for this transportation service is zero emission. Dr. Holger Buscher, consultant to the German government on rail and environmental issues, says that making the change to a hydrogen fuel transportation system requires just a little imagination. So you have to make your vision how life could be with a train system, safe, quiet, not noisy with cars, um, and clean energy driven, cheap, you don't need an own car, no traffic jams, all that kind of stuff. Lovegrove's vision includes the construction of a hydrogen-fueled electric railway connecting the entire Okanagan Valley. The zero-emission lightweight trains require far less infrastructure than standard trains and could provide a myriad of benefits, from greatly reducing traffic congestion, pollution and deaths, to allowing affordable connection for those who can't or choose not to drive, all at a cost estimated to be far less than further widening Highway 97. We are addressing congestion, pollution, noise, uh, connection, aging in place, health care, socialization. Hydrail technology running the entire length of Highway 97 from the U.S. border up to Kamloops solves so many of our sustainability problems in this valley. Why not? One group that is eager to explore the possibilities is the Penticton Indian Band through their new cool economic development office. I think we're excited about being able to uh, participate in global innovation, leadership in climate change and bringing it to where it's going to make a difference in our neighborhoods and in our communities. With the Hydrail project as a catalyst, the band is now actively seeking to develop new clean industries, such as solar-powered hydrogen production and converting diesel rail to hydrogen power as part of building a sustainable economy. We've been working at a business case for the last five months in terms of cost of production and management and partnership. The groundwork has been laid out very well by Dr. Lovegrove and his team. This is a very exciting project. Um, the majority of the railway system in North America is freight-based. The opportunity that's offered here through UBC and the First Nation partners to decarbonize freight rail has huge potential and a big impact on the overall sustainability goals of society. Dr. Lovegrove says he's excited to see the results of his research sparking such interest. There's an economic incentive, there's a greenhouse gas climate change incentive. If Canada wants to remain competitive, we need solutions, we need to provide clean rail technology and that's the mandate driving our hydrail research. Let's kind of, kind of dive into some of the questions, and um, uh, I just want to start with, um, you know, the, the, the Okanagan region of British Columbia, it uh, has a less, uh, uh, the population is much less dense than on the coast on, in the Vancouver area. So, so, uh, so regarding the hydrail and building the hydrail line, passenger line, uh, is, there, is there a demand for this? Like, where, where, are, the, where are the people going to come from for this? Right. And so traditional responses in transportation planning in urban areas are, well, there's density. In fact, I remember a CBC interview with a, a, a rail and transportation planning expert from an urban area where they say, yeah, there's there's not enough density. Uh, so your, your point is well taken, Jason, except that um, 
there's another factor that creates demand and it's called tourism. So I'm sure many of the folks on this call and worldwide that are going to view this video after it's taped will appreciate that um, you just don't have to go too far. I, every time I travel to Europe, the best rail systems in the world are transporting not just commuters and that residential density, but tourists to and from destinations, airports. We have an international airport in Kelowna. We have a regional airport in Penticton and Vernon, Kamloops, all the way up and down the valley. We happen to have our largest trading partner not too far from Penticton, the United States, which has a rail line at the border that we would connect to. And so now you've got tourism, ecotourism. We are a valley that's pushing and been certified as ecotourist destination now. And that's what we're talking about, meeting the demand that is coming in the next generation of environmentally conscious tourists and people that are sick and tired of, of driving and getting stuck. I, I'm not going to rant and rave, but I live in Kelowna and I see Highway 97 in the summer and our traffic is like at a standstill on Highway. It's horrible. It's horrible. There's lots would, of demand. Yeah, if I could just add to that, I remember my days as a uh, business analyst for Transport for London. And so um, the better, what I'm seeing is the benefit case is, is not just a benefit, it's a disbenefit. That money is being spent anyway. So by being more strategic and looking at rail, working with the Ministry of Transport, uh, what we're saying is, look, you've got a plan to spend that money anyway. Let's be more strategic and spend that in a way that ha is, is more sustainable for the long run. So it's not like um, you have a traditional return on investment you have to calculate. The money is going to be spent anyway. The, uh, the, the existing plan and pattern of uh, you know the transportation ministries is that they tend to expropriate a lot of other people's land um, broadening highways along an incredibly beautiful stretch of the Okanagan. So uh, if we're going to do that, let's be more strategic and let's spend a little more time and money on uh, shifting culture towards something like rail. Um, yeah, you know, so I, I don't think the um, we need the density is, is that's not the entirety of the business case. Go ahead, Gordon. In fact, transport equity and environmental justice really is the core. And one of the things we've got worldwide, uh, Vancouver, Kelowna, two of the hottest real estate markets, is lack of housing supply, affordable housing supply, and access to that housing. Well, guess what? Uh, transport equity, a lower cost, safer, cleaner, greener alternative, provides housing then to folks to travel up and down the valley between jobs and and not just the tourists. So so now you've just increased reach at a more affordable, safer way. And that's why in the video, we talk about all these things. And, the, and we actually use the exact same business case template that our province uses to prepare their business case for widening, as Jonathan said, the highways and, and trampling over our beautiful environment, which is what people are coming to see, right? And that exact same business case template populated with data for rail versus widening a road has twice the benefit, twice the benefit. And even four times, if you look at the fact that if we delay road widening, because we now we've got a re reasonable equitable substitute, we've now got almost 20 to one benefit cost ratio because of delayed construct highway widening costs, not just hopefully, uh, prevented, precluded, what it precluded, whatever the word is, uh, never widened. I think that uh, some, I, so I, I'm born and raised in Vancouver, and, um, and there's a lot of people leaving Vancouver the last few years because the housing prices are just bonkers. And young families and young professionals, they just can't afford to get into the market. So I have lots of, I know lots of people who have moved to the Okanagan to take jobs. So you're right. So it's more of a regional transportation strategy because you could work in, or you could live in Penticton or in Vernon, but work in Kamloops or Kelowna and having that, that high speed kind of easy access transportation system. And you could, you could cop, copy and paste that kind of strategy to, to uh, the Edmonton Calgary corridor, uh, uh, other quarters in Southern Ontario, uh, maybe uh, Sask uh, Saskatoon, Regina in Saskatchewan. So um, you're right. There is, there's a future kind of model here, I think, in, in what you're trying to achieve here, right? The other interesting model, the other interesting aspect of this is, I'm not sure if anyone really knows what the future of work is going to be looking like post post COVID pandemic. We, we are moving to um, almost permanently having a number of our staff working remotely anyway, which, from the Okanagan perspective, you know, we have a big our 
the luxury residential development. Um, you know, we're getting tons of people coming from Vancouver. And so this valley is going to be uh, growing significantly. Uh, it would be really nice to have transport corridors built in ahead of that happening so that we don't have to try and suddenly work around uh, other big developments. You know, yeah. so, you know, it's just, I think we're living in some interesting times and it'd be nice to be do to do the right thing uh, moving forward. Yeah, great. So it's just, I, I, want, I want to touch on the point a little bit later, but I also want to hit upon uh, freight. So there's a lot of talk about moving people and, and tourists and and, uh, and workers to and from the, in a very uh, more efficient and and uh, and zero emission way. What about freight? Where, where's There's a lot of freight lines that travel across the country and through the Okanagan in British Columbia. Where do they fit in this picture? Yeah, it's certainly that's actually come up <clears throat> and we've been talking about it as a, another potential revenue source. But let's revisit the, the definition of freight in, in, the, in the context of the Okanagan Valley. I, I think I can speak for myself, most of us. The last thing I want to see is a mile long freight train rumbling down Highway 97 through the heart of all these cities and towns linking the valley. That's, that's, that's not the freight we're talking about, people. What we are looking at, though, is something like, remember the trailers on the back of a Greyhound bus? I call it light freight, and this is actually a technical term, light freight. We're talking one, maybe two cars of wine and fruit uh, or courier packages. That's the kind of thing you will see. This is predominantly, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a regional passenger train connection. And we have other solutions for freight in such a short corridor. It's not going to be economical unless these are long freight trips and those go by other avenues. And as we get more people out of cars and onto the train, guess what? We're going to have these beautiful retrofit kits that we can fit into trucks to make them zero emission fuel cell battery hybrids as well. So now you've got electric trucks, the good old freight trucks we see having more room on the road to continue doing what they're already doing for our freight. And that's actually what killed uh, the rail line up here was the, the, the trucking are more economical over shorter distance. So you're not gonna see so much demand for freight as you are for the regional passenger uh, demand, Jason. For me, that would be a killer. That would be a showstopper to see or expect to see heavy freight trains. Remember the grades wouldn't allow it. That bridge, the Okanagan floating bridge, four to 5%, not gonna happen. On the other hand, if you've got self-powered electric passenger rail cars, like uh, the what you had seen in the graphic, absolutely every, axle is powered on that rail car with passengers it's lighter and it can go up any grade and around any corner highway 97 currently runs that's why we're saying actually route is not a, a showstopper either we can go along the lake if there's corridors we can go along the highway if there's uh, not down the center of the highway and and one comment i would just clarify you mentioned speed High speed rail. No, 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 no. Maybe oh. between Edmonton and Calgary, it's high speed because that's a highway at 100 plus clicks an hour. We're talking highway speeds along highways and city speeds stopping at traffic lights or roundabouts going through roundabouts within cities. Okay. The speed would be according to the context. We really, you want to have safety, right? It, we're it, culture change. Think about the buses that, that right now run in Kelowna and, and hopefully in, in Penticton. Uh, we're going to connect all these communities. We'll have a regional. The buses now stop at lights, go highway speeds, and that's what we would see this tram train running at. It's a tram train. It's not a freight train. Okay. So it's almost like a, like a large-scale LRT line, basically. Well, large-scale is interesting. When you think about it, these cars, they're only two car units. It's basically, a, in Vancouver, you've got accordion buses, you know, on the B lines. It's perhaps a little bit longer, but it's not that much longer, and it fits 160 people. What you saw in the video is actually representative of, of what we expect. Could uh, Jonathan, do you have any? A quick comment. I'm not an expert in freight or, or rail per se, but uh, it's, an, it's an interesting question, but it's a question that comes up so often usually from um, from government, uh, and what it is, it, it very quickly evolves into co scope creep. And you're looking at a solution, and, and governments tend to often want to look at one solution that fixes everyone's problems. Um, 
you know, and, and just simplifies things in their minds. I, I think it's a really important factor to consider, but that's just not the reality. We live in a, a world of complexity that doesn't provide those one-shot solutions. We, just as an example, uh, for us, it makes complete sense to start converting our, our heavy equipment trucks to, to hydrogen. So uh, those those are those are trucks that the metal has been smelted, the, the trucks have been assembled. Why on earth would we ever want to try to create another whole system for something that is largely working? Let's try to improve the system we've got. So when we look at um, nature and creation, um, nature is constantly adapting to, to what is. It, it doesn't go out and try and find something from outside of itself to then create this new thing to solve another problem. That's what governments tend to do. So what we're constantly looking at is doing that. So when we look at the full life cycle uh, and impact on the environment, um, it's far more favorable to look at what we have and to adapt that and take a next wise action rather than try to do a one big solution that's going to solve all the problems. You know, that just doesn't line up with, with complexity theory. It just doesn't line up with reality. Uh, it's one of the big reasons why you have such a waste in, in government spending on massive, massive projects that don't deliver the benefit. And yeah. so sometimes taking these smaller iterative steps will give you a far better outcome. Can Great. I uh, just build on, Jonathan is also uh, in his own right, a culture change expert. He's done it in all the organizations. That, that's his expertise, his training, his forte, and he does it. Um, he speaks from a wealth of experience, not just knowledge, on culture change. And just to underline, what he's really saying is you, you change a culture. You can do it two different ways, very quickly and very painfully, and have a lot of pushback. And it's, in my mind, probably not going to be sustained change. And we just saw it south of the border with healthcare programming, et cetera, politically. Or you can change it in baby steps so that people get used to it. And one of the things he's talking about is exactly that, the retrofit kit that you could retrofit existing rail, buses, and as I mentioned, heavy freight trucks. Also, think about this. Are people thinking we are going to literally run rails through the heart of cities? Rails are divisive. So what do they do in Europe? Look and learn from people elsewhere around the world. And embedded rails is a way to maintain the car traffic, the truck traffic, everything on a road. And all you're doing in the HOV lane, for example, in Kelowna, would be embedded rails to allow the tram train, which is just a little bit bigger than the bus, like I said, to use the same road. We're not creating a barrier. We're actually eliminating it and connecting communities. Yeah. And I, sorry, just to add again, I, I really think this is where Kutrick plays such a critical role. And, and you guys hosting these sorts of conferences, like a very powerful mechanism is you just showing pictures and videos of what is possible. You know, having I'm a I'm a relatively recent immigrant here from England, uh, and so when I speak to rail to a lot of folk, they just can't imagine what I'm talking about. They 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 either thinking Vancouver rail system, but they they're not imagining what what um, Gord is talking about a tram system that works with the city as opposed to just divides the city. Uh, and so showing pictures and 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 press releases and videos and graphics is actually really powerful as far as just helping shape people's mind um, yeah. towards what it could look like. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I think just for the sake of our audience here, uh, Jonathan, I just give just reference some of your, your background. I think you, you did work in, in the London Underground uh, system. Is that right? Yeah, so I, um, my um, my background, I was actually trained as a, as I came out of seminary. I was trained as a, as a minister, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, but I'm not a very sort of I, re religious guy, so my focus is always on trying to bring about change in that context. Not always well received, but anyway. Um, and so I, I became a one of the change ma first change management directors of the biggest policing change program uh, in England. So we moved over their training systems, and so my role was working with the National Center for Applied Learning Technologies to implement uh, eat what was what we now call online learning. This is back in the early 2000s. Um, and then, you know, we did really well at, at affecting that change and you had every county then signing up to that change. Uh, I then got asked to support the, uh, what they call the C3I program in London, which was the implementation of 
um, CCTV cameras uh, and airwave radios and sort of centralized communication command and control systems for police in London. Uh, and one of the chat, and this is this is probably one of my favorite stories. One of the challenges was introducing CCTV cameras back in the day. Um, they had been fighting for nine years to try to get uh, support from uh, the public authorities, governors, and everyone else uh, when they were talking about implementing CCTV cameras. Uh, and the team that um, I came in to had created a, a little shift. They stopped talking about CCTV cameras and they started talking about safety cameras. And so when you can create, um, for one of a better word, a level of desperation or urgency or fear, the amount of change that you can get asked for is absolutely enormous. So we are right now in, in the middle of exactly that with the, the pandemic. Um, and we've got to tread carefully because you have a lot of different motivations and ten intentions for the change that we're wanting to bring in. Uh, but when you've got people um, operating out of a basis of fear or a sense of loss, um, you know, 80% of people tend to be more motivated by uh, fear or the removal of something than by a chaining a vision. So we have a cultural challenge in North America where um, a lot of people want to create the vision and expect people to come to that. That's very exciting and nice, but that's actually not how change happens. Change happens by people being motivated away from something else. So when we talk about introducing something like rail, we do need to be talking about some of the negative elements. We need to be talking about how much money are you going to be losing or wasting if you don't look at the solution. If you look at traditional rail, how are you going to be div dividing communities? Um, while, while the dominant sort of media culture in North America tends to want to highlight the benefits, the actual change is going to come by highlighting the disbenefit. And so my background is working, just working on some of those nuances and helping, um, whether it's governments or, or normally large universities, introduce the change. And if you've done a good job at introducing the change, normally you don't have to try to sell it because people will be desperately asking you for, for that change. And we, we're seeing exactly that right now. Um, yeah, so in rail yeah. and travel, somehow we've got to find that, that sort well, of balanced message. Well, I just want, I just want, I just kind of follow that tangent a little bit, and that there's the, you have a different philosophy with this project, um, and I know that you're looking through like through an equity lens, um, and that uh, whether whether it's it's a hydrail project or any rail project in British Columbia or anywhere in Canada, or in the United States for that matter, um, what you know the the role of the indigenous communities uh, is is I know it's a very high. Uh, it's very high. It's very very important in this project. And as someone who's working with the Penticton Indian Band, I know that that is that is a, a paramount kind of um, uh, part of the structure of this project. Can you speak? And, and just for 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 viewers who are outside of Canada, earlier this year, I think it was back back in January and February, there were there were protests around the country where there were uh, First Nations communities and non-Indigenous uh, supporters who were blocking rail lines across the country. Uh, protesting um, uh, the sort of different infrastructure projects that would uh, just that would use that would come across First Nations territory without their consent, um, and so there was lots of rail block blockades, and so they, those have died down, and COVID kind of changed the, uh, you know the, the map for everything, but but just in the future or looking forward, how do you see uh, working with First Nations communities in Canada? Uh, if, if, it, if it's a rail project in Quebec or the Maritimes or in the prairies, how do you, what, what kind of philosophy are you trying to, trying to create here so that this could be copy and pasted in different parts of the country? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I'm going to apologize up front. You've, you've uh, picked on the reason why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. So I, I, one thing I didn't mention about my background is I grew up in South Africa uh, during apartheid. Uh, and, and, this, and, and like everyone, like a lot of white people growing up in apartheid, we believed what we were told, we believed what we were educated, we believed what the media uh, sold to us. Um, and so when, when the, lo the rock is lifted and you realize, oh, that's actually not true, that's not how the majority of people in this country have lifted, you go through, I would say, um, if you're really dealing with the issue, a little bit of a, uh, well, not a little, a significant awakening uh, and questioning of everything you've held to as being true. 
Um, so I got involved quite quickly working with the Independent Electoral Commission um, on the first democratic um, election in South Africa. So I have a passion for uh, truth and reconciliation and, and sort of was quite closely aligned with, with what was happening there. We had, um, you know, so we had a lot of, you know, we've got a lot of South African stories that we can tell, which are unfortunately not, not uncommon. But when I, when I emigrate to Canada, um, I unfortunately see the same thing. Um, but Canadians are really, really nice people. So <laughs> yes. in, we tend not to talk about these things. But unfortunately, you've got incredible injustices that have happened over First Nation territory, and it's still happening today. And the and what we, what First Nations get, in my opinion, working, you know, I worked with the chief, we went to see the premier, we went to see all sorts of political leaders. As a non-Canadian, walking into those meetings with the chief, I can see I can see straight through the BS. You know, everyone everyone has been educated enough to give the right answers. And when you're in government and you have a lot of power, it's very easy for you to create no end of obstacles to actually making change happen. Hmm. Um, so my role is really to try to say, look, the injustice around rail, uh, just expropriating lands and cutting off communities and dividing communities, not just that, but polluting the ground that the, the rail is going over, is huge and that is something that needs to be spoken about don't don't think that you're going to engage um first nations without having acknowledged the the reality of what has transpired uh don't try and hide that and don't try and cover that up acknowledge that so we we spent a lot of time myself working with the previous chief we've got a new chief elected in uh but but just saying look let's call it out for what it is mm -hmm. and now the question is now what uh, so when we look at now what the thing is how do how do first nations and their companies participate in uh, a different type of rail program how do how do first nations rather than have someone from the outside come in and say oh we're going to consult with you before we're going to steal from you uh, that's not good enough so so my role is to say look as as a, as a company as a set of companies how do we position ourselves to be the leaders within a, a new sustainable economy. You know, First Nation folk have an incredible amount of knowledge around the damage that has been done to the land, the water, and the air, um, and and are passionate around making sure that we don't keep doing that. So when we look at um, the Kettle Valley Rail, which has just been returned to the First Nation ban, that that corridor most likely still provides the best corridor for rail through through the Okanagan um, in a lot of ways. Um, so I would say to the government, don't don't try and come and expropriate that again and think we're gonna we're gonna do that hands down. What we're saying is we're lining up companies. We have a, a number of companies that will want to be involved in actually if we're gonna build a rail system, we wanna build the rail system. If we're gonna have ownership over the assets as the First Nation companies, the the the, the First Nation needs to own those assets, and we can lease those to you, and we can do with everything else, and we can cooperate with you. So don't try to consult with First Nations prior to stealing from them. And this is and this I'm, is a conversation that every company in Canada that operates rail should be having with their First Nations community. Is that, is that how you feel? So you said that again. So this is a, this is a conversation that every 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 rail company, every every stakeholder that's involved in these projects should be having with with the local First Nations communities, regardless where they are in Canada. Yeah, and if you can't have that honest conversation, um, hire some immigrants to come in and and have a real <laughs> honest conversation because uh, it's really tough. Uh, and I I have I can I I push my liberties as much as possible as an immigrant uh, that I couldn't do in South Africa. And to, to be very honest, like as a South African in South Africa, it was more difficult for me to participate in the new South Africa because I, I had inherited huge amounts of privilege as a white South African. As an immigrant into Canada, I don't have that, that baggage so much. So I have more luxury, which I exploit every single day of the week if I can. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and I think if we have a very strong lens of truth and reconciliation, I think these these sort of large uh, government projects are the most beautiful opportunity for that, but yeah. but it, it needs to happen on the ground and 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 the you know we have a big a big vision but we act small and so what we're actually doing we've got a pilot project around transitioning some of uh, maybe two or three vehicles to hydrogen uh, in January, 
and that gives us a foothold in that space, which is you know incredible. Um, and think, so think, we. Yeah, it's just I think what you just said there was brilliant. It's just it because it, it really does lift all boats. And and the First Nations communities they have, I mean, they really want sustainability is part of their DNA, and uh, they want to see these types of projects and they want to be part of these projects. That's that's the kind of the, the, what I've seen in different work, different work, and different things I've done in my career. Um, if, so that I think that was that was brilliant. I think that's something that that is not talked about more enough uh, with rail projects or any infrastructure project, projects. There's a critical piece of this, Jason, and I, I think I really need to put this in there. Mm -hmm. And if there's any government people on the line, I really hope they're listening to this, is government and government funding programs towards more sustainable projects like this uh, are not managed in a way that are, are fair or equitable or just when you're looking at First Nation communities. And one of the primary reasons is because First Nation communities have more barriers in accessing capital, believe it or not. In reality, forget about what the Prime Minister's announced about billions of dollars going. That's just not the reality on the ground. And so the obstacles in, it, in, in uh, receiving grants and funding are almost, imp almost impossible for First Nations to get to. One of the reasons is because they, they, they don't have a financial equity that, that uh, other communities have. They don't necessarily have the long track record of in large infrastructure projects because they've largely been excluded from those. And so when we look, so, you know, my big ask of government would be, and I think there's research that backs us up, is when you're providing funding to First Nations, you need to remove some of the, the barriers and the hurdles and the tick boxes that you normally play with, you, you normally apply to everyone else, because I don't think it's a fair or equitable model for uh, funding First Nation projects. And I think if you if if you're a little more flexible on some of the criteria, um, yeah. If Justin Trudeau wants to offer two billion dollars to First Nations, let him actually give that to First Nations and let them be creative in what they do with that. Don't you know? You're getting the political points for making the statement. Now let's actually just give it, and let yeah. and let things fall where they may. I think people will be incredibly surprised on how to do that. So so that government funding mechanism when it comes to First Nations really needs to be reviewed significantly. So I see questions in your chat, and we've been answering most of them as we go. And I think Jonathan's just answered the last question. I think we've already answered the first two or at least addressed them. But let me just say truth and reconciliation as, as a colonial white guy from British German family. So I, I, I very respectfully say this in my lens and my experience, the, the local stakeholders are always the experts. You need to form a respectful relationship with them. And by relationship and respect, there needs to be trust. I completely agree with what Jonathan said to the point of it's really a word of control. You've heard of the golden rule. He who controls the gold rules. So so let's say if, if our political uh, leadership, not just in the country, but also in BC are serious. And remember, I've been involved for two years with Jonathan. I've seen this to a certain extent through their lens, through their eyes. Um, and I've also been writing a lot of grants, competitive and otherwise, for umpteen years, decades. I've seen it through otherwise. We need to say, give the control, here's the funding, and give the control to a, a, a First Nations body to disperse and decide and demonstrate. And in my view, to uh, Mikhail, I apologize if I've just butchered yeah. that name. The first thing we have to do besides getting some funding is, and, and that is the funding, then do a demonstration project, start small. I, I talked about baby steps before. And, and that's one of the, on the list, fourth quarter 2021, that Jonathan mentioned on his slide. We need to demonstrate this technology for the locals to come and take a ride, for big railways and every other industry to see the technology, touch, feel, sniff, not quite taste, but you understand, well, you could taste <laughs> the water because the emission from hydrogen, right? Hydro, hy hydrogen fuel cells is water, right? Steam, electricity, and water. Yes, cool. even taste it. Cool, can I just uh, maybe soften that a little bit? So it, it's really, <laughs> Okay, I'll get my hammer out of the way. <laughs> but when he says that we, want, we need to give control to First Nations. I think what Gord's saying is what he's observing in the way that we've managed these projects is we're leading them and we're managing them. 
What we now do with them, and let me explain to you internally, is we are not naive to this, the challenges we have around capacity. You know, we have a, a band, our band's maybe got uh, 1,200 members, uh, perhaps um, not all of them are engineers, so we don't have that natural capacity. So when, when Gore talks about giving control, um, I, I always, you know, I, it's, that's not one of my most favorite words, you know, the only control that we want to have is self-control. Um, <laughs> but the way we do that, it, it, and historically, one of, the, one of the challenges we work through is most of our companies, a lot of our companies, when we do lo really large projects, we try to enter into partnerships with other companies uh, who have capacity, who come alongside of us, and they have a commitment to provide us training and, and support. We don't want to give away the crown jewels, so we want to maintain control. So normally that conversation from a sort of has always been, or we'll, we'll do a 51% 49, 49 split so that we still maintain that 1% control of the project. Now, that makes things easier, uh, but the risk to the stakeholders that that 1% control uh, puts into the mix is significant. So we don't want to be under any illusions that, that this is going to happen overnight. I actually, I am really pushing for, and I really like the idea of an absolute 50-50 partnership. And if all stakeholders are not agreeing, nothing happens. Now, culturally, my mindset is coming from Europe, where you have many, many coalition governments, where that's sort of how they operate. Um, unless we have agreement, we're not going to move forward. The, the, kind of like the former the, minority government the, in BC. The being 49 is a discussion around control, but I think that's the wrong narrative. The, the narrative is let's have a shared vision and let's make sure we agree on how we're going to move forward. So um, in me saying that the justice needs to be done and returned, I don't think it's helpful to, um, you know, I think what we're saying is First Nations don't want to rule the world. They just want to be able to rule themselves and they just want to be part of everything else. So, so it's not a battle for control. It's a battle for being equal partners with everyone else to, to make this thing work and sustainable. So, you know, I think behind behind the, the curtain, we're actually looking at partnerships. We're looking at good partners, at equal partnerships. We don't want to be railroaded over, excuse the pun. <laughs> so, so, so on, I mean, the part of the, the audience here watching this panel, I mean, we have Alstom, we have ABB, uh, HDR, there's lots of consultants, there's lots of companies that, that do these projects all over the world. So, I mean, right now, this 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 hydrail project in the Okanagan is still in its sort of uh, infancy stage. It's still it's still in the planning stages. Well, so, hold what on, you're saying? Hold on, is, oh, hold, hold on. on. Actually, Jonathan and myself have met, and we have had extensive discussions. And you know, because a lot of this, we showed up in Toronto with the chief, with technical experts, and we have local government. We have the city of Penticton. We have the Penticton Indian Band, and as well as technical and science-based researchers, and we have been reaching out and building a coalition of support. So there's planning, but what I'm trying to say is very quickly, given the right, uh, okay, I'm going to use the word Jonathan's coined, partnerships and funding, we can move quickly. And that's why fourth quarter 2021 for a demonstration project, Jason, it's doable. It's doable. We, we actually have headquartered in Kelowna, for example, Western Canada's largest railway construction company, Caribou Central Railway Contractors. They work for CN. They work for CP. We have partnerships with Southern Rail of BC right now. We're already doing research projects. We're actually currently retrofitting the first locomotive to Hydrail. This work is on the ground. It's going. Partnerships are in place. We're ready to move. Okay, so that's a good point. So uh, we have about five minutes left in this panel. So actually, Jonathan, Gord, if I can ask you, uh, type in your email address in the, the first chat box uh, so that people, if they want to reach out to you to learn more, maybe per perhaps get involved. Uh, because I know like for, for all the panels in, in this conference, we have uh, lots of thought leaders from different companies um, around the world that's it, it, that's watching right now. So I uh, encourage uh, them to reach out to, uh, to Gord and Jonathan if they want to learn more. And um, this is very exciting because I think this is really... This is a new paradigm you're trying to create here as far as sort of the federal government uh, First Nations um, initiative um, that could be, again, I think you could really kind of change how we do business in, in this country. Um, so I just want to go into the technical side a little bit. Um, so what's so what what what's what are the what are the hurdles right now as far as moving this project forward? Well, I, I think the, the, the two 
have already been mentioned, right? We, we've got to have some funding to a demonstration project. And that is the key to overcoming the culture change. And, and that really, you know, researchers, Jonathan mentioned UBC often leads social change. We have community leaders. I like to call Jonathan and his community the trusted voice of the valley. They've been leading the charge and, and, and fostering and nurturing these partnerships. And they're coming along beautifully. We're at the point now where we almost literally on the rails have a retrofit for the first Canadian hydrogen powered rail vehicle. We, we already have a, a working prototype that's scaled down version of it. So, so we're pretty well there. We have some research we need to do for full scale system integration, rail cars, self powered rail cars, same idea. It's, it really are those two points. Jason. Where's, where's the, where's the hydrogen going to come from? Where's, 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 where's the fuel coming from? Jonathan, I'm going to let you answer that one. Yeah. So we have a, a fairly significant relationship taking place with Ford's gas. So um, there's a couple of steps taking place. First thing we need to make the business case is to convert our, our heavy duty vehicles to hydrogen or hydrogen hybrid. We then have a relationship with Hydra and HTEC to be able to um, refuel those engines. And what they're doing is they're taking uh, the offtakes from existing uh, chemical companies and they're taking the hydrogen. They would, you know, call that tend to be gray hydrogen as it were. Uh, that's, that's, there's, there's no end of that that is available right now. Um, the other pieces we're looking at, once we have our trucks converted to diesels, we will be looking to produce our own hydrogen through a combination of solar, wind, uh, but most of the hydrogen is highly likely going to come from the natural gas line where we convert natural gas to hydrogen. Uh, and so that's where we were able to bring the price price down a lot. Um, we Our relationship with Ford is, is that as we as we look to um, you know produce hydrogen, any excess hydrogen we'll be able to insert back and sell back into the hydrogen uh, grid. And they they've uh, their analysis allows says that they could take 15% hydrogen into the natural gas line. That allows them to very very quickly hit their 2030 uh, emission goals. Um, so um, yeah, you know, and that's a really good example. So when we're looking to work with the city of Penticton to convert all their diesel generators to hydrogen, which are normally used to back up fairly uh, secure systems like hospitals, um, they, their question is, where is that hydrogen coming from? The second question is, is it green hydrogen? Is it blue hydrogen, gray, uh, gray hydrogen, turquoise? So um, to be honest, any blend or shade of that hydrogen is, is making things better and improving things. So uh, yeah, there's no end of, of sources for that. We're wanting to become our own hydrogen pr provider in, in the Valley and are working closely with Fortis. In Alberta, we have an early relationship with ATCO uh, and are working with some First Nations up there as well to try to see how do we, how do we help them plug into existing infrastructure. Okay, cool. So we have a couple minutes left. So um, uh, this has been this has been an awesome uh, conversation. It's been really uh, uh, illuminating. Gore, I'll just leave it to you for uh, last word, a couple of minutes, a uh, minute and a half of uh, just uh, your final uh, take and just any kind of lasting impressions you want to leave from this conversation. Well, I, I, I can't underscore <clears throat> enough the word partnership and Jonathan's brought up. Um, I remember being invited when the NDP government was in Alberta to by the Alberta Economic Commission to talk to their steel fabricators because of their de depressed oil gas industry to see if a transition technology transition technology transfer was possible and they were all eager 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 <clears throat> well the government has changed that has slowed down because we don't have that leadership but I see hydrogen the hydrogen economy of Canada, hydrogen rail, hydrogen trucking as a way to transition the Alberta economy. This is good for Canada. We're not just talking folks in BC. We're talking all of Canada through partnerships coming together, going forward into the future with an equitable, respectful, uh, sustainable community. No, I think I think that that sums it up quite nicely. Um, okay, we're right on time. So, uh, Gord, Jonathan, as always, thank you so much for your time. I think the work you're doing 
is exceptionally important, and uh, I think it really could be uh, groundbreaking as far as how we how we move forward on rail infrastructure projects in this country. So I think uh, so. Kudos to all your hard work, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing this conversation in uh, conferences to come. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye bye.